This piggin is a bucket with a convenient handle. The cooper made barrels. The bulging side enabled a single person to move a heavy barrel by rolling it along the ground. Tunis explains that a farmer could laboriously hollow out a tree trunk to make a barrel, which was then called a gum, but preferred instead to trade for one made by the village cooper. Barrels were made to store either dry goods such as flour and thresh grain, or wet goods such as molasses, maple syrup, cider, beer, salt meat, or salt fish. To support the weight of fluid, wet barrels required strong wood that was one inch or two and a half centimeters thick. Kegs were made to store rum or gunpowder. Coopers also made wash tubs, pails, churns, and piggins. The cooper used a curved draw knife on the shingle horse to make wooden shingles for barrel sides. The staves were heated to give them the right curvature. These staves were held upright. A rope windlass was used to winch the staves tight and then a hoop was hammered downward to form a tight seal. The staves were then trimmed to be level. A wooden hoop was used for dry barrels and after the year 1800 Iron hoops were used on wet barrels. Pottery has been made and used for 10,000 years, since the time of the first villages of ancient Mesopotamia. We saw that food storage pits were lined with clay to keep out rodents and insects, and that this practice quickly evolved into portable clay vessels. Decorative styles on clay pottery is a fashion that changes with each decade and for each group of people. Tunis explains that in North America, between the years 1600 and 1750, pottery was made from plain brick clay that was naturally colored pink through red by the iron oxide within the clay. This produced a fairly basic pottery that was soft and leaky, but also used by most every family. Today we use ceramic or plastic dishware and little pottery. But for the previous 10,000 years, every family made daily use of pottery. The colonial potter in North America usually worked part-time in pottery and was also a farmer. All of these basically start out the same way. You get this round piece of clay onto the center of the wheel and now you're just going to go on to shape it. Clay consists of fine particles that stick together and can be easily shaped when wet. The potter used local clay that was dug, cleaned of pebbles and roots, mixed with sand to prevent cracking, dried and left to cure for weeks, and then re-moistened and kneaded with strong hands to remove air. The clay was then shaped on a foot-powered wheel. Tuna says that to see a skilled person shape clay on a wheel is to watch a small miracle. He says that wet lump seemed to take on a life of its own as it flows upward under the potter's hand and swells and shrinks at his will into the wanted form.
The potter made containers, one after another, each being nearly identical. Containers include pails, dishes, pots, cups, and other storage vessels. After being shaped, pottery was hung on a peg to dry for a day. Handles might then be added, or perhaps the item would be decorated by pouring a thin line of wet clay onto its surface. Pottery is next hardened by being fired in a kiln. Throughout the world, the quality of pottery is determined by the temperature of the kiln. For example, earthenware is fired at a much lower temperature than is porcelain. Colonial pottery was fired by being placed in a kiln kept hot for 25 hours by continually loading and burning wood. We are uh, firing this kiln here. It's got about 750 pieces of uh, pottery in there. It's going to turn the glaze that we coat them with into a uh, glassy ceramic texture. It takes about 36 hours to reach temperature of uh, 2,000 degrees. <laughs> well, you know, you need to uh, tend to the fire constantly, so there were people here uh, overnight. The job it was to keep stoking the fire, keep it uh, well fueled. It's, uh, you would only do a kiln firing about once or twice a year. The pottery was then allowed to cool very slowly so as to avoid breakage, though one in four of the items were still lost. After firing, colonial pottery was no harder than a modern flower pot and it was just as porous. It was then glazed in a second firing. The glaze was red or white lead oxide with sand mixed in to the consistency of paint before being applied to the items insides or outsides. Firing changed the oxide into glass that was colorless. To instead have a brown color, manganese was added to the glaze before firing, or to instead have a green color, copper oxide was added to the glaze before firing. Most every family had pots, plates, and cupware that were redware. A slight drawback was that this lead-based glaze was poisonous and killed many potters and pot users. For that reason, this redware was eventually replaced with stoneware, which is both watertight and stronger. But in the kiln, stoneware must be heated at a higher temperature and for 48 hours. <laughs>